My name is Dan Parak. I coordinate the annual country study this year, the year of Cuba. Um, as you're aware, uh, we've got a great lineup of events this semester. Um, I'll mention next next week at 1 o'clock in Music 109 on, on Thursday of next week, we have Heidi uh, Recoder from the, she's a professor of music history at the State University of the Arts in Commonwealth, Cuba. So she's actually coming here from Cuba to talk to, to us, and she's going to talk about Afro-Caribbean elements in Cuban music. Uh, so that's next week, and uh, we have events every week. So there's something uh, going on all the time for the year of Cuba. We're going to have a big conference in March. That includes a concert by um, award-winning jazz, uh, Caribbean, uh, Cuban jazz artist. Um, we're going to have a big theater performance at the very end of the year with a, a group from Miami coming. So there's really just lots of great programs and opportunities for you to learn about Cuba um, coming up, not just today, but all semester long. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Seneca Vaught. Uh, Dr. Vaught is Professor of Interdisciplinary Studies and History here at KSU. So we collaborated and worked together yeah. quite a bit, and um, uh, I know you're in for a great talk and a, and a, and a really interesting angle on, on, this, on, on this issue, on the topic of Santeria. Um, his, um, his uh, teaching and research uh, focus at, at the intersection of culture and policy to investigate uh, organizational development and social change. He's won a Teaching Excellence Award for his community-engaged uh, pedagogy um, and the William Wells Brown Award for his ongoing support of this applied historical methods in community development. Uh, he, served, he served as a senior fellow of information and technology at the African, Africana Cultures and Policy Studies Institute and interned at the Trans-Africa Forum. Um, so he's published numerous articles on the intersection of policy, religion, and culture, and especially uh, across uh, the African diaspora. Um, most recently, he spent a semester at sea, yeah. so we're all jealous <laughs> and of, of him way. and my experience. That was he, great. He got, uh, he was able to to do uh, representing KSU. So um, please welcome him. And thank him. <laughs> Well, thank you, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here with everybody. This is actually my first day back on campus since July of last year. So this is the first time. And I, there's several things I remember that are the same, finding a parking spot when you're running late for an appointment. So it's good to be back. And I want to thank everybody for coming out today. Dan and I have a great history. I also want to acknowledge Dr. Silva here. We work together a lot on numerous projects including an upcoming one in Ecuador that we're all looking forward to. But today I want to talk with you a little bit about the topic of Santeria and Cuba in particular, but more as a transnational hub, thinking about Santeria as a form of cultural diplomacy that links diasporic communities together. So I've entitled our talk today, Diasporic Rituals as Healing and Community Practice. And in order for us to get there, I want to begin by sharing with you the story of the person who introduced me to Santeria. Um, he's now deceased. He, this is an excerpt from the obituary of the Toledo Blade in 2005. I was a graduate student in Ohio at the time working on my PhD. And I came across this uh, man. His name was Josovi Eason. And Dr. Eason. Um, was a, a lot of different things, but one of the things that he was very passionate about was traditional African religious belief systems and how they apply to the diaspora. Uh, I met him, I interviewed him, and his story was just so compelling 
to me that it made me want to really understand more about who he was and also more about the subject of today's talk. He was uh, from Atlanta, Georgia, not too far from here, as you know. And he was a conscientious objector to Vietnam War based on the principles of Martin Luther King. As a result of his um, activism, he was um, imprisoned for refusing to be inducted into the US Army. And when he was imprisoned, he and other activists continued to use pacifism as a means of expressing their disagreement with the war. Ultimately, this sent him underground. This is a period during the 1960s when a lot of activists would just drop off the map entirely. He went underground, meaning that he, he didn't come to class, he didn't go to school, people didn't know him, he was hiding essentially from law enforcement. And he was having a lot of legal problems at the time that he was not able to resolve with his case. And that took him to a man by the name of Osergeman, um, and a village in South Carolina called Ayatunji. And in this village, um, Oba Osergeman told him exactly what he needed to do if he wanted to um, address these charges that he was facing and wanted to clear his name, so to speak. So what happened is he followed those beliefs, he followed that direction, rather, exactly. And within a decade, less than a decade or so, his record had been expunged. Jimmy Carter, President Carter, um, granted an amnesty um, to all the people who had various charges related to conscientious objection in the Vietnam War. And his story became a story not only about how he found redemption through Santeria and through this, this sacred practice, but it also became a story in how he found meaning in his life. As someone who had been brought up as a cultural nationalist, he became equally a political nationalist, engaging diaspora communities. And then, as you saw from his obituary, he became very involved in using African traditional beliefs, of which Santeria was one of, the, of several that he practiced, to help communities, diaspora communities, all around the world engage um, with themselves and with each other. So that was how I became interested in him. And it took me um, to the place where he first encountered Santeria um, with Obo Sergeman and Ayatunji in Sheldon, South Carolina. At the time, as I mentioned, I was in Ohio. And a group of us were students, just like you. We were studying. We didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have a lot of time. But we were very excited about um, some of the things that we were learning in our classes. We were taking notes. We weren't so much into a lot of the other extracurriculars, as you can imagine, in a, of a rural town in Ohio. So we thought it would be a great idea for us to pack up in a van, and we all would drive down to South Carolina to visit this village of Ayatunji. He heard about our plan to go, and he decided that he wanted to come with us because it would have been the first time in maybe 15 or 20 years that he would have a chance to revisit. So it grew, it grew. We ended up renting a van. All of us went down to the Ayatunji village in South Carolina, and we learned the story of this African-American by the name of Walter King. Walter was from Detroit. And in 1959, he traveled to Cuba and became the first African-American to be initiated into the Yoruba secrets of Obatala. He then returned back in the United States, where he set up a series of workshops around African religion. And ultimately, he decided to create what became known as Ayatunji Village in South Carolina. And the rest links into the part of the story that I just told you. He was the first African American uh, to be initiated into the secrets of Obatala. But after a break that we may have a little bit of time to talk about later, after he broke from Santeria, uh, the Lukumi version, he then was reinitiated, I should say, gained another title as a Babalao in Ileafe, Nigeria. So this is a lot. I know this is a lot for you because I've taken you from Ohio to South Carolina to Nigeria to the United States to Atlanta. And here we are today. How do we make meaning of this? Many of you, for the first time, are probably just hearing the term Santeria. What is Santeria? Can we start with that for beginners, Dr. V? Well, we're going to 
as I approach all of this in the few moments that we have together. But I thought before I do that, I'd show you a short little clip done by Vice News that explores Ayatunji, this African village that exists in uh, South Carolina. It explores a little bit of the history of that institute and how it and African traditional religion through Santeria and other traditional forms emerged to impact the people um, in this country and around the world. So I'm going to show you a very brief clip. It's about four minutes or so. And then we'll jump into the definition. So in that clip, you saw some snapshots from Ayatunji, that African village that was recreated by the father of that Oba, Oba Sergeant here. And what it means in the context of the current diasporic experience. What I wanted to focus on in this particular uh, time we have together today is how Santeria 
this syncretic Afro-Cuban um, religious form plays a diplomatic role throughout the diaspora. So I have to begin with a little bit of uh, some disclaimers first for those who may be watching in years to come or who sit in the room. First of all, I'm not an initiate of Santeria or the secrets of Ifa. I have never claimed to be. I don't claim to be an expert on the subject of Santeria. However, what I can offer you today is some of the experiences that I have had that I would say most people who are initiated into the secrets of Santeria have not been afforded. I've had the opportunity to visit the source of where many of these beliefs originate from in the continent of Africa, and I've had consultations with several Babalaos who have given me permission to share some of the information that is not secret as a result of visiting various sacred shrines and other, other places. So I take that kind of responsibility uh, very seriously. Um, and with that, it leads us to a little bit of an overview of what we'll talk about. The first thing we'll discuss is how Santeria acts as a diplomatic force throughout the African diaspora. It takes us from Cuba, it takes us throughout the Americas, it takes us in the United States, throughout Brazil, back to the continent of Africa, all the way through Europe and around the world. And we'll look at that and think about how it works not only as a force of spirituality, but as a diplomatic force, as a platform where people can express their beliefs, where people can express their ideas, where people can ask questions about what it means to be, to exist, to know, to have, to struggle, to strive. It tells us about questions of substance, all of these things, about time and space on a non-Western, non-European way of knowing, a different epistemological approach. So what I would ask for you to do is many of you, I'm assuming, are very similar to me, coming up in very conservative Christian backgrounds, where from the very beginning, Santeria and anything that deviated from the very normal norms of what you encountered in church on a Sunday morning was the devil's work. But what I would ask for you to do is to suspend your beliefs for just one moment and to engage in a different way of knowing that predates those European expressions of Christianity. We know that the first Africans walked upon the continent of the earth prior to any other continent in the world. And we know the first time human beings began to ask questions about who are we? Where did we come from? What is the purpose in life? The very idea of Christianity had not yet been born. Therefore, it emerges as all other great traditions of the world emerge based on a fundamental African premise. And that requires us to suspend our judgment, to suspend our beliefs, and engage it on its own term. It does not mean that you're a bad Christian. It does not mean that we're attacking your beliefs. How fragile are our beliefs today? It merely says that we must encounter this experience on its own terms, on its own grounds, on its own methods and ways of knowing. And with that, when you do that, I promise that you'll see what I saw. You see that Santeria has, it's not an omnipotent force in the world, that it also has had to respond to threats, to persecutions, to questions that it could not answer, that other religious traditions presented different questions and different answers that it found appropriate. We also see how Afro-Americans, and by the, when I use this term, I want to distinguish it from African-Americans. When I say African-Americans, for the most part, I'm referring to Americans of African descent born in the United States. When I use the term Afro-Americans in the context of this lecture, I'm referring to the Americas as a plural and persons of African descent living or moving throughout those continental masses. We'll also look at the spatial role of this Cuban-based religion as a transnational hub, not only a site where people come, but as a place that connects people together around the world and where they create new communities, as you just saw, as in the manifestation of Ayatunji. All right, so a great book that I recommend, if you had me at class at KSU before, we might have read this book in class. I read it. It was a really great experience reading this book in the Atlantic Ocean with my class in the fall semester en route from Ghana, West Africa, to Brazil reenacting the same route of the transatlantic slave trade 
we were reading the story of this man, Domingos Alvarez, who was a, he was a priest of this belief system called Bodun, which originates in a country today called Benin, which formerly was a region known as Dahomey. And he found himself, as many others did, in the midst of a slave war between the king of Dahomey and the king of Wida to the south. And what the king decided to do was he decided that many of these priests were troublesome. They were challenging his political authority. They were offering alternative ways and systems of knowing that they had to be gotten rid of. So he began to round them up and chains and sold them into slavery. This is happening between the 1730s and the 1750s. Many of them made their way all the way from Western Africa to places that you may have heard of, places like Haiti, places like Brazil, and places like Cuba. So Cuba is going to accept, and you'll, I'll show you a, a little map of this later, Cuba is going to accept about 725,000 persons of African descent from Western and Central Africa and from the slaving coast. This is, a, this is a small fraction of the 11 to 15 million who would be transported, but it's larger than that proportion that would come to the United States. Only about 500,000 would come to the United States. Of those that went to Brazil was Domingos Alvarez, this Vodun priestess, priest um, from Benin. And when he was in the Americas, he immediately began to put his sacred knowledge to work. He began to heal people within his community, people who were enslaved, who did not have access to uh, traditional means of medicine. He began to use his traditional knowledge about herbs, about roots, about plants to address their maladies. This is very important to think about. Because at that time, and some would argue um, to this day, knowledge about healing was policed. There's not open access to knowledge. You can't just go out and practice medicine in other terms. It'll end you locked up and in jail. So what he was doing was something that was illegal, but it was also seen as a political threat to the crown, because the crown and religion, Catholicism and Portugal, you know, the, are one. When you, when you are against the religion, when you're not a Christian, you mean you're also against the king. Very different from in the United States, where there's a separation, allegedly, between church and state that we'll come to um, a little bit later. But to be a, to be a non-Christian in the Atlantic world was to also be a traitor. It was to be someone who was um, treasonous, who was attacking the crown. But he found that all the people who were suffering, all the people that were hurting, did not care about any of that. They just wanted an answer to their immediate problem. So he began to practice, as James Sweet um, outlines in the work. And he found that many of the herbs, many of the plants that he knew from the continent of Africa, he could also identify in the New World, or he found approximations and created various potions, et cetera, to meet various needs. In fact, he became so efficient, he, be he became so effective that his owner began to elevate his position and rely on personally his skills as a physician to heal not only him, but people within his household. household. And then things began to turn rough for Alvarez. We don't know exactly what happened, but the mistress claims that he put a hex on her. And he was sent in chains from Brazil to Portugal to, to face the Portuguese Inquisition. That means he was going to be put on trial for not being a Christian, et cetera. Right? But it makes you think. If he was, if this is really true, why go through all the trouble? Why didn't his master just kill him right there on the spot? Which leads many historians to think that there is something behind the story, one of two things. Either one, the master recommend, recognized his powers 
that they were so effective that he feared any repercussions that could come as a result of slaying him on the spot? Or two, he doubted the testimony of the mistress. He thought that she was lying. So she, he wanted to give him another way to get out. To make a long story short, he goes to Portugal. He faces the inquisitors. They put him on the rack. They begin to break his body and to torture him. He says, look, I don't practice any form of witchcraft. All I do is I seek to heal people. I seek to help people. They turn the rack again and begin to break more of his bones. They broke almost all the bones in his legs, all the bones in his arms, and began to work on the middle part of his body before they forced a confession on him, from him. Right. Why go through all of this pain? Why go through all of this? Why go through practicing these secrets under the cover of the night? What is it within this particular belief system that would cause it to want to endure such pain? I would argue part of it was the benefits that it brought. We know that it helped address the alienation caused by warfare. Many people from different ethnic groups, people who could not um, communicate through each other through a common tongue, use this Yoruba-based belief system that we're referring to here as Vodou. There's other names that you'll hear me use interchangeably um, that operated as a lingua franca. In other words, they may not have come from the same people groups that they spoke the same language, but they recognized elements of a religious belief system that allowed them to transcend those beliefs, that, that allowed them to transcend language, rather, so that in captivity, that belief system became a common base by which people could communicate ideals. And for this reason, this is why when I went to Benin and I went to some of the traditional sites um, where Vodou originated, where it came from, and then I had the opportunity just this last year to visit Brazil, and I went to Cachoeira, as well as these other places where these Yoruba-based uh, belief systems thrive, in Brazil, they call it candomblé. In Cuba, they call it santeria. In Haiti, they call it vodou. All of these come from a common source. It's like the root of a gumbo. It's the base. But it takes on different flavors, different elements, different aspects in different places. But initiates can go from one place to the other. They can hear the drum. They can see the dance. And they can immediately identify whose orisha or whose goddess that represents. Because it's a common language. It's a diplomatic language, a diplomatic approach to healing, a, different, a dif diplomatic approach to knowing that transcends boundaries, right? Let's look a little further, deeper here. There are some themes that I want us to think about. This, is, this comes from the Encyclopedia of the Religious Experience. In Cuba, in particular, the Catholic Church was tolerant of ethnic traditions and allowed various African groups to create clubs called cavillos. These cavillos were not only ethnic clubs, but religious organizations under the secret leadership of the Babalao. This is like a priest of the religious functionary whose patron divinity was Oremilla. Oremilla or Oremilla is the oracle divinity of the Yoruba. She's the person or the god of knowledge, of wisdom, right? Libby goes on to say, the contact between African religion and Catholicism in Cuba yielded a synthesis known as Santeria. There was a strong symbiosis, sometimes you hear syncretism, between the Catholic sacramental system and that of traditional African religion. Under the Yoruba Babalawo, the Catholic calendar was wisely utilized for the veneration of African saints. The word Santeria itself means veneration of the saints. There's a lot to package in there. We're not going to package all of this. I'm coming at you, assuming that you know a lot of this, but I'm probably sure that many of you don't. But just the, the topic of the talk doesn't give me a lot of time to go into all the or original aspects and lay the foundation for that. But the good news is, if you're interested in this topic, we have plenty of classes that deal with these right here at KSU, Same, shameless plug right there. So what you, what you see here is true, but it's also not true. There's some aspects of this that I want to clarify um, for you because it relates directly back to the subject at hand here. It is true that there are numerous examples 
of Catholicism being tolerant of um, African traditional belief systems, particularly in Cuba. And it is true that today, if you ask someone from Cuba if they are Catholic or if they're ATR, if you say, are you a Santero, they'll probably say, you know, no, I'm Catholic. Some 60% of the population will say I'm Catholic. But we know that a lot of people will identify as Catholic, but they will, in actuality, practice these beliefs with a fervor that, you know, it would, you would wonder, OK, are you, are you both? How are you both? That form of symbiosis, that form of syncretism, is something that Protestants have a very difficult time wrapping their heads around. Because Protestantism focuses on a strong distinction between um, Protestantism first and Catholicism, and then within that, between the forces of light and darkness, and et cetera. It emphasizes this duality. Where, particularly in Cuba, as other places in the Americas, Catholicism tended to be much more flexible in its belief system. All right. <clears throat> The other aspect of this that I want you to think about, because I mentioned this is true for the most part, but it's not true, is this notion of tolerance. While it is true that for the most part throughout Latin America and the Caribbean, because of the absence of large populations of European descendants there, that enslaved persons were, for the most part, free to continue to practice their traditional beliefs, et cetera. We have a proliferation, and we have a, a preservation of traditional belief systems. That's, that's true. Whereas in British North America, because of the large population of Protestant descendants and European descendants and the proportionately small population of people of African descent, most of these practices in their purest form were eradicated through political and religious persecution, forms of terrorism. However, in the current mind, many people use this as shorthand to say that Sant uh, adherents to Santeria are not persecuted today in the United States, which is not true, that I'll talk with you a little bit about, and that they were not persecuted in Cuba which is not true, that I'll also share with you some information about. While I'm sharing that through the next few slides, I want you to think about the diplomatic aspects of what is going on here with this religion. As it's being persecuted, how is it responding, and how is it forming a base that is addressing these uh, questions? All right, this is the map I promised you. So we have, coming all the way across the Atlantic, the vast majority of enslaved persons go to South America via Brazil, the largest number after that through the Caribbean. And Cuba, this, this large island, is going to find where the subject of our talk is centered in this Matanzas province, this, this northernmost province in Cuba, where most of these practitioners of what they would refer to as Lukumi are concentrated. From there, this center would then spread um, across the island, but also would find ways historically to spread to the south and to the north across the bodies of waters that existed there. That brings us to this question that I foreshadowed of, OK, well, big deal. What does that mean? So we began the story, I gave you the story of Domingos Alvarez in the 1500s. We're going to bring it up now to the 1990s. Domingos Alvarez is being persecuted in the 1500s uh, because he dared to be, we're not ready for you yet, Castro. Come back. Domingos Alvarez was being persecuted in the 1500s because he dared uh, to adhere to the, this ancient belief system. But we have this case um, with the Cuban diaspora in Florida during the 1990s, where it's an interesting case that I think raises some of these, these themes as well. So a ritual within Santeria, as many of these other traditions, Vodun as well as Candomblé, involves sacrifice, ritual sacrifice. For a person from an American context, 
largely in the very conservative religious belt of the South that may cause you to be, feel a certain way in your stomach. Um, might I remind you that the purpose of today's lecture is not conversion or proselytization. It is simply to present an alternative way of thinking, an alternative way of knowing using the foundational knowledge, this form of epistemology on its own basis, on its own terms, right? Nevertheless, I will engage you in a simple thought, let's call it a thought exercise. Some of you perhaps grew up Catholic, some of you perhaps grew up Protestant, and you took the sacrament of communion, in which the bread which symbolizes the body of Jesus is broken and consumed, and the grape juice or the wine, depending on one's tradition, which symbolizes the what? Blood. Of a person, of a man God, <laughs> is consumed, drink. May I remind you that John 3.16, one of my favorite texts in the Bible, reads, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but should have everlasting life. God had to give his Son, and that Son had to be sacrificed on a tree. His blood had to flow so that you and me, that's if you're a Christian, can live. So the, the notion of sacrifice is not a new one. It predated the Christian idea of sacrifice. And as I mentioned to you before, Santeria draws on a very old belief system that predates Christianity, it predates Islam, it predates Judaism, etc. That notion of sacrifice runs through it, particularly the sacrifice of animals, usually chickens. I know y'all love Chick-fil-A. I know some of y'all, all of you are not vegetarians in here. Yeah, it gets real quiet. That, that chicken in Chick-fil-A was sacrificed for your enjoyment so you could eat. That chicken had to give its life, right? Now, I'm being facetious, but uh, within this process, animals are killed, usually chickens, and they're eaten. They're cooked and they're eaten by the people that are there, some people that grosses them out. How can you kill something and eat it? You know, well, we do it all the, all the time, right? And the people in this town, Hialeah, Florida, became um, cognizant that um, a man, a Babalawo, was engaging in these practices and he wanted to establish a church. So he came to the city council. The city council said, we are a Christian country. We are a Christian state. We are a Christian city. This type of um, acts will not be tolerated here. The, and they outlawed it. They said the unnecessary killing of an animal in a public or a private ritual for ceremony, not for the purpose of food consumption. The reason that they mention this is because Lukumi Babalu Aye is a particular Orisha. There are, there are hundreds of Orishas. There's probably 20 that are common that people all will all recognize. But there are hundreds of ones. One, this one particularly deals with wrath and with sickness. And when someone was sick, they would put the transfer, rather, the, the illness from a person to this particular animal. And then they would kill that, they would kill the animal, OK? So they, they made a law particularly that was focused on these practices, both killing them for food and this symbolic practice. And the councilman, Julio Martinez, noted that, look, in Cuba, People were put, getting put in jail for practicing this religion. We sure as hell aren't going to let it go down right here in the United States. Ernesto Pichardo, who's the Babalao there, he takes this case all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court unanimously rules in his favor, says that the city ordinance violates the free exercise of that beloved and sacred document, the Constitution of the United States of America. They said, if you had created a law that specifically forbade the slaughtering of animals based on cruelty of, towards the animals themselves, then it would have been fine. But you cannot single out a religion, one particular religion, based on another religion or tradition being primary and use that as a principle. 
interesting to think about. This causes a lot of tension between the people in the Santeria community in Cuba, many of which are recent immigrants from Cuba to the United States, and the people who had been here um, for more, I should say, for more than one or two generations. Right? On the one hand, it represents a war, a conflict, a clash between cultures, with one people attempting to assimilate, to merge in, to melt in, to be part of this American identity, and another group seeking to remember the trauma of the transatlantic slave trade. The knowledge, the indigenous knowledge that came from the continent of Africa was preserved through generations in the Americas. And this, these two belief systems are on trial. It's not about the slaughter of animals. Nobody has problems with killing animals. This is about two ways of knowing, two fundamental ways of knowing, ways of being and how you approach those questions. So Councilman Martinez mentions that in Cuba, people who practice this tradition were being put in jail. He's absolutely right about that. I mentioned in the very beginning of the slide that um, Babo Sergeman goes to Cuba in search of the secrets of Obatala, and he's initiated in 1959. This is at the height of the Cold War. We're not ready for you yet, 21 Savage. He's at the height of the Cold War. And he goes there. Think about if you're an African American, you're traveling to Cuba at the height of the Cold War to seek secret knowledge from a religion. Most African Americans are Christian. Most African Americans do not speak Spanish. Most African Americans have never been outside of the United States. You, you, you see what's going on? We're talking about diplomacy at work here. He's seeking answers to questions, pressing questions that are not being addressed. He goes there. He seeks answers. This is 1959. And in doing so, he goes against the wishes of the United States government that is openly hostile to Cuba. This is during the Cold War, right? At the same time, he arrives in Cuba. Santeria is not the official state religion of Cuba. After Castro comes to power and the revolution, he then turns attention to Santeria and begins to do exactly what the councilman Martinez says, and uh, put people in jail who are practicing religion. It was seen as being backwards. It was seen as being African. And thereby, since it was African, it was inferior. Think about this. Think about this. Uh, excellent scholar. Um, has written about kind of this notion of blackness in Cuba and how the very early days of the revolution, ideas about blackness were essentially outlawed. For example, it was illegal to have an afro. It was illegal to underscore any aspect of African folklore. Now, part of this is part of a, a Marxist orthodoxy that, that um, kind of seeks to downplay the role of religion. But it's also, there are also racial elements in there, to be sure. So what happens? What changes? Equally important, what was the question that propelled Babo Sergeman to seek these questions here? Were those effective answers? Can't answer all those questions today. But one answer that I will give is that something changes in Cuba that changes the position of Fidel Castro from being openly hostile to Santeria and being openly hostile to African folk religions and traditions to embracing them. There are several ones I'm going to summarize in one. The uni of Ile Ife, or the uni of Ife, the equivalent to the pope of Ifa, this sacred basis from which Santeria originates, visits Cuba in 1987. He's a diplomat. This is a diplomatic corps, right? Just because he's not coming from the United States Secretary of State's office does not mean that he's a dip, not a diplomat. He's doing diplomatic work. And you see Fidel Castro here shaking his hand. And after that, there's an opening up of, so to speak, and a preservation and a promotion of these cultural forms, saying that they're not in violation of the principles of the revolution. 
something I want you to think about. This is 1993 in the United States, the home of the free and the home of the brave. Why is it that people who had recently immigrated in several generations to the United States feel threatened by this religion in a country who claims that all faiths are created equal and that people shall never be discriminated against based on their beliefs, their color, their creed, or the content. They're, uh, got to think about that. What is it about this particular belief system that allows it to be flexible, to absorb the persecution of others, that allows Africans and people of African descent all over the world to find peace, to find healing, and to form communities, and allows the secrets, the, the knowledge of humans, of Africans, to be passed on generation after generation. Now. There's Gunplay, 21 Savage. Some of you know. Both of these um, individuals are adherents to the tenets of Ifa, the secrets of Santeria. Um, 21 Savage, many people would say, uh, you know, um, might not be the best poster boy, so to speak, for, <laughs> for Santeria, considering his recent legal troubles. But in the... <laughs> And another, and another, um, and another hand, gunplay, cited Santeria as doing something very similar to how I began the presentation with uh, Jasovi Eason. He went seeking answers that were not being provided in a time of crisis in his life. He was facing some charges, and he found healing, he found help, and he found a sustaining faith, an alternative way of knowing that helped him to cope. So what can we conclude from this? Is this, again, an attempt to get you to convert to Santeria? No, not at all. I would, I would say, as Jasovi Eason told me, whatever faith that you have that you feel comfortable with is just fine. You don't need to, you don't need to convert. You don't need to be something different than who you are. But maybe it behooves us to think a little bit more carefully and critically about this notion of diplomacy, this notion about who we are in the world, where we exist in the world, the historical connections between us that connect us not only to the present but to the past, that connect us not only to the community here in the United States but around the world. Hopefully I've got you to think about how Santeria has acted as a force both historically to do some of that um, but also how it continues to play a major culturally cohesive force through the Americas. So we've talked about how these attempts to suppress it made it stronger. We've talked about how it's helped African Americans to deal with questions, Afro Americans to deal with questions about who they are, time and space. And we talked about how it continues to be a transnational hub that is, albeit based in Cuba, is really belongs to the world. As now Cuba sends um, its um, diplomats to none other than Ile Ife, um, the birthplace of one of these traditional forms, to engage people there as well. So Santeria is a global religion. It's a global way of knowing that continues to present new ways and new questions for us to address many of the challenges we face today. That's all I have for you, but I'd love to engage your, your questions and your, your comments. Thank you. I'm sorry, Dan. Go ahead. Um, with the point as you were talking, what was the visit in 1957? The, the 1959. So I, thought, I thought there was a visit, or maybe it was 59. The, the Oni? This one? No, the previous, the one that was earlier. Was 59. I think it was 59. Yeah. So this is when. Uh, while he's in Walter King, he goes to Cuba. 
and he becomes initiated um, into the priesthood of Obatala. While he's there, he's the first African American to do so. He comes back, and this is, uh, this is something to think about because this is going to add a racial and ethnic element to what we're talking about here. This is the year of Cuba, so you're, I'm sure you've been reading a lot about Cuba. And within the United States, we have a very firm binary when it comes to race. We think about race, black equaling African Americans. We don't have any type of flexibility for the varieties of black experience and the marginalized others. But I want you to think about something interesting. He goes to Cuba. He has to go outside of the United States to Cuba, a place that is not widely perceived at that time in the world as being a very African place today. We know better, and now is. But at that time, he has to go there to be initiated into an African way of knowing that he then comes back to the United States and then begins to initiate others into. Think about that. As E. Franklin Frazier, he's a famous sociologist, would say that the, the aspects of slavery were in the United States were so cruel, were so gruesome, were so efficient that they would largely erase all aspects of an African consciousness from the mind of African Americans. However, Melville Herskovitz would argue, well, if you go throughout the Americas, if you go throughout Latin America, as well as the Caribbean, you can find intact these belief systems, these ways of knowing, these cultures. So he goes and he finds. He gets them and he comes back and then he adds his nationalist spin to them. He politicizes it in a way that comes out of the African American experience. And in doing so, he decides that he's going to go further. He he's, then breaks from Santeria, and he goes to Ileife, and then he's initiated in Nigeria proper into uh, the secrets there. So that's a very interesting trajectory. Because a lot of people would say, why bother with Latin America? Why bother with the Caribbean? Just go straight to Africa. But Santeria teaches us it's a diplomatic platform in which the diaspora is connected through the world. So you get elements of knowing and being and understanding by connecting them all together that you do not get from just one aspect, right? I think there's a question over there. That's a great question. And historians, I'm a historian by training, tend to look for these events to hang everything on. And we say, ah, as a result of the only of, of Ife coming, all this changed. This is really a symbolic event. There's things that are changing, um, but it's a symbolic event that we would say is somewhat of a watershed. I keep doing that. I had an auto time to push me. We see how good I am at that. Um, but what happens, ultimately, there's two forces. One is some of these symbolic visits. Uh, there's another instance in which Cuba had sent something like 25,000 troops to Africa and Angola, as well as the Congo, to fight um, there, to help um, the independence movements there. And many of those troops that went were Afro-Cubans. They were Cubans of African descent. Some of them were not. You know, Che Guevara went as well. And, um, one of them, Victor Drake, comes back, and he's still alive. He gives some of his testimony. But many of the other ones come back, and they had an exposure, a firsthand exposure to Africa that prompted them to want to be more connected to their African roots, so to speak. And they, their force, their presence, um, helps to convince Castro and some of the others that perhaps there is uh, of more than a, there's a political force behind this religious belief system. So that starts kind of a, a resurgence. Another thing that is equally important is, of course, money, because money kind of pushes a lot of, a lot of things. Um, there had been a, a steady stream of African Americans and Afro-Americans throughout the Americas who are going to Cuba to become initiated and are going specifically to Cuba. The jazz is great. Seeing those classic cars are great. But what they're going to do is they're going specifically to get initiated into the secrets of Santeria. And that had become somewhat of a business. 
so to speak, and with that, it, it, it gained somewhat of a currency. And that's another factor that fed into that, it being formally acknowledged. That was a great question, by the way. Yes? That's a, that's a tough question. <laughs> that's a really tough question. I think there's several answers. I'll, I'll give you one of them, and we can talk about it more if you sign up for one of my classes. Or better yet, come with, come with me to Ecuador in July, and we can <laughs> we'll talk about it. I'm, I'm joking, only partly. But part of, part, of the, part of the answer to that is, in the United States, there tended to be much more a focus on racial purity as a symbol of one's piety. So Protestantism as kind of a guiding principle would often talk about whiter than snow, et cetera, and it would use those metaphors to enforce a, a strict racial division between black and white. In reality, we know that that didn't work out as well as it claimed, you know. Otherwise, I wouldn't have the last name bought, and you know, <laughs> and a lot of other issues going on in the room. Um, we know that there was a lot of racial mixture in the United States, but there was not as much racial mixture in the United States as existed in Latin America and the Caribbean. There was much more, much more there. So, although it was looked down upon, also in uh, Latin America and in Catholic parts, the more Catholic concentrated areas. Um, the physical production of people merging, not only racially, but religiously, became much more of a metaphor for what existed there. So it, it became much more um, permissible. People would say, you shouldn't do that. But everyone knew that after night, everyone was going to be practicing these belief systems. So that to a large extent remains, remains today in Cuba. It also remains in other parts of Latin America. Well, but in the United States, we still don't really have that idea that you can be multiple religions. You can have multiple ways of knowing. And that is largely comes from that Protestant, that Protestant culture, the impact of Protestant culture. So that's a very complicated answer that I gave you. But in doing that, I'm hoping that you're thinking about how religion itself becomes a metaphor for politics. It's not like politics is completely separate from religion, but they're intertwining. And embedded in them both are racial ideologies, race, racial ways of thinking, racial ways of knowing and control and power. Yeah. Yes? Yes. We were um, the practice of um, the origin, um, well, what we commonly call use of religion mm -hmm. in the origin are mm -hmm. common. Yes. So that's, that's a common place for me. Um, and, 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 and looking at these slides, I'm looking at the um, high priest who went went out seeking, you know, another way of, of knowing mm -hmm. and recognizing. And I, what I was trying to do with this on your mind phone is, I mean, just the physical resemblance of uh, the priest, mm -hmm. of one of our priests in Trinidad, they, mm -hmm. they could pass for like twins. So that really, wow. <laughs> that really, I was trying to pull up something to see if I could get his picture to show you. And that really stood out for me. But it, your presentation has added another dynamic to what I will be looking at in my research. So definitely, I will have to be communicating with you. So thanks, thanks for sharing that. Thanks. Now, was it the, the Uni from Ife? Yeah. 
Oh, wow. That's, that's interesting. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to the fact that I'm aware, um, you must have heard of the American people yes. of, of Trinidad, mm -hmm. right? And I'm aware of the connection to the Golokichi people yes. yeah. of South Carolina. And there, there was some intermingling also with the Waro people, with native people of Venezuela, mm -hmm. with these groups. And um, when I was at the University of Tennessee, <coughs> and like the church, I used to be Yeah. Community coming and they're doing these um, dramatic pieces. But it, it just shows how um, schools or, or facilities like the performing arts and how they keep these histories alive in certain spaces. Um, that's in Trinidad and Tobago, but I know it's a different reality in different spaces. So mm -hmm. this is just very enlightening for me. No, Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. And you know, there's this African way of knowing, this base, as I call it, or the rue of this gumbo, so to speak, makes it possible for these expressions that she was mentioning, like carnival, everyone's heard of carnival, et cetera. But if you take out that element, if you take out that African element of that, you don't get carnival. You just get a party, right? So that, that element, that rue, that, and the fundamental characteristic there, should not be foreign to those of you who are Catholic or those of you who are Christians, because the Romans had this same philosophy that they created a temple called a pantheon. And anyone who they conquered, who they came in contact with, they would incorporate those gods into their temple, right? One of the things, and remember I told you that these systems, these ways of knowing predate the Romans, which predates ancient Rome. But one of the things that made um, Vaudun, Santeria, and other forms, Candomblé, Lucumi, so, so able to survive was their ability to take on those aspects of what they encountered. So when they encountered Christianity, they didn't encounter it as a dualistic battle between the force of good and evil. They said, oh, we recognize those elements. Oh, you may call that St. Peter. We have a name for that. Oh, that you know, and they, it becomes part. It becomes fused into one new tradition, right? So if you want to really understand Caribbean culture, as she pointed out, you want to really understand it, you have to enter it through this way of knowing, through this different epistemological lens. Thank you for that comment. Other questions, comments? All right, my final word is as a good vegetarian, I now command you to go and to sacrifice and eat your chicken for lunch today. No, I'm joking with you. I, I hope you've learned a, a couple of things about Santa Maria, and particularly in a different light, perhaps, than you've thought of before. So when you come across different ways of knowing, different ways of interpreting the world, just be mindful that some of these forms are ancient and have brought people together and have held people together for thousands of years. Thanks for coming out today. I appreciate it.